So first of all, I'd like to thank Alistair and Berserker for inviting me to speak today. Um, a discussion of the importance of scale, history and time in archaeology is of critical importance at the moment, I think. And so I'm delighted to have this opportunity to explore these themes a little further. Scale represents an interesting inflection point for many of my research interests. Between 2007 and 2010, I worked with John Robb on a, and others on the project that became The Body in History that Alistair referred to earlier. Uh, the, the book there aims to construct a long-term history for the human body over around 40,000 years. My field project in Ardnamurk and Western Scotland engages with long-term change in a single small bay on the north coast of the peninsula. In both cases, the aim has been not only to work at the large scale, however, but to critically reflect on the interplay of scales in a non-determinist and non-reductionist manner. Not coincidentally, my theoretical interests include working both at the very small scale thinking about the emotional and effective experiences of daily life, and how to integrate different scales together. In particular, I've recently argued that assemblage theory allows us to construct interleaving scales of analysis that run from singular pots to entire periods. In the paper today, I want to think through some of the implications of our increased chronological specificity in prehistory, pre and in particular the potentials that Bayesian analysis offers in the light of the ontological turn, or rather in the light of specific elements of it. Due to my commitment to critical engagement with theory, and as promised, a desire to plug my book, um, I'm duty bound to open up the black box term, the ontological term, and have a look inside. By doing so, I aim to show that while specific elements of the turn might challenge the particularizing desires of small scale narratives, in fact, the reverse is more often the case. That is, rather than a rival claim, to quote the session abstract, I will argue that much of the ontological turn lends itself precisely to small-scale and particularist narratives, and indeed demands a far greater specificity than the standards of history normally allow. As I will indicate through the paper, my own view is that archaeology should continue to work at a variety of scales, from the very small to the very large, and that these scales are folded together in complex ways that are very hard to separate. To give away my conclusion, I would argue that the central move we need to continue to make as a discipline is not to continue our, to commit ourselves to a specific scale of analysis, but rather to reject our obsession with anthropocentrism, with being centred around humans. And here, Alistair and I certainly do disagree, I think. This can be done through the construction of historical narratives at a variety of scales, though whether history as a discipline is the best model for this remains to be seen. Archaeology should, in other words, be about what happened in the past, but it will not solely be about people. So let's begin by opening up the black box of the ontological term, the rival claims to particularism that the session abstract speaks about. There are many different elements to the ontological term. An initial division might be between the new animism, symmetrical archaeology, and new materialism. Each of these, especially the latter two, can of course be further divided. And I've taken Ben Alberti's body pots to stand for the new animism, uh, Olsen et al's book for um, symmetrical archaeology and Andy Jones' prehistoric mater materialities for new materialism. Symmetrical archaeology, for example, breaks into two pretty clear waves. The former most strongly influenced by the actor network theory of Bruno Latour, the latter by the object orientated ontology or triple O of Graham Harmon, an author appearing in that book we heard about a moment ago. New materialism might refer, amongst other things, to the agential realism of Karen Barad, the vibrant matter of Jane Bennett, or the assemblage theory of Manuel de Landa. Different areas of the ontological term hold different things in common. The divisions can most strongly be seen between the recent triple O influenced versions of symmetrical archaeology on the one hand, and new materialism on the other. Triple O influenced symmetrical archaeology downplays the importance of relations, embraces the essence of things, and celebrates their withdrawal from our knowledge of them through a rejection of writing history in favour of pragmatology, what they term pragmatology. New materialism, by contrast, sees everything as relational, utterly rejects essences, and tries, successfully or otherwise, to engage with more traditional archaeological questions. So there are lots of different approaches here with different aims, desires and purposes that can be at radical odds with one another. What is shared by different forms of the ontological turn is a desire to put up, put up for question some of our most dearly held assumptions about how matter, substance and agency, for example, work. They all query the boundaries of people and things and the nature of causation. The problems are shared, they're all reactions against Cartesian orthodoxy, but the solutions are not. 
It is an open question whether the label ontological turn has any real purchase. And lumping these things together can do damage to their differences, as Chris Whitmore as a supporter and John Barrett as a critic have demonstrated. My own preference, if we want to link these approaches together, is to refer to them as post-humanist, in the sense that like post-processual archaeology, they're only really united by what they reject. The critique hinted at in the session abstract, therefore, that the ontological turn offers a challenge to the desire to write particularist narratives may be true of a certain element of, the, of these ways of thinking, but it is not so of others. In particular, it's not true of new materialism, the approach that I find most productive. New materialism is a growing movement across many elements of the social sciences. It is new in that it embrace, <coughs> embraces the importance of the material world in a manner analogous to Marxism, but rejects the anthropocentric and deterministic approaches of the latter. In new materialisms, all things, that is people, places, substance, animals, plants, and so on, are the outcome of sets of relationships that are in flux, in movement, and becoming. Materials in particular here are not treated as lifeless dead matter, awaiting the enlivening touch of a human being, but vibrant, active players who contribute to their own histories. Rather than a potter taking a dead lump of clay and imposing a mental template upon it, new materialism revels in the morphogenesis of matter, the way its own tendencies and capacities help, it to help shape the form it takes. The emphasis on vibrancy means that life is no longer the sole property of organic beings, but is a force that flows through the world. This approach is thus rigorously anti-dualist. There's no distinction of nature and culture here, and it is non-anthropocentric. Human beings are one form of life amongst many others, and access to language does not raise them ontologically to another level. In most of our accounts, we tend to treat human beings as the actors with all of the agency. Even ideas of object agency, that is largely derived from human beings. Secondary agency, as Alfred Gell would have it. For new materialists, though, human beings play no greater role ontologically than anything else. They may be the focus of our interests as archaeologists, but to understand them properly, new materialism argues, they cannot be ontologically elevated. This does not mean that human beings are the same as things, but it does mean that the differences will be historically emergent. So how does this relate to historical specificity? One of the first moves new materialism makes is to throw into question our assumptions about the properties of materials. As these are no longer essential facts, but rather historically and relationally emergent, they are up for grabs. Chantelle Canella's outstanding 2011 book from which these images are taken gives excellent examples of this, looking at the way in which properties of different materials in the Upper Paleolithic vary depending on the relationships in which they are caught up. These are relations that include other people and other materials. New materialism thus embraces the dynamism and variability of the world, and this applies not only to material things, but to people, animals, and plants as well. This seems to me, philosophically, to demand a lot more historical specificity than traditional approaches to archaeology do. If you declare that humans are the only ones with agency, that matter is fixed and only meaning is variable, that nature, biology and environment are one sort of thing, but culture, language and beliefs are another, then it seems to me you are treating a much greater proportion of the world as ahistorical than a new materialist would ever do. Now, of course, new materialism is what we might call a meta-ontology, just like the dualisms beloved of traditional archaeology. So in this sense, it doesn't put absolutely everything up for grabs. Unlike a genuinely open approach to local ontology, as per a Martin Holbrand in anthropology or a Ben Alberti in archaeology, new materialism does have a number of axioms. The world is imminent, not transcendent. It's about relations, not about essences. Stability is the exception, not the rule, and so on. Nonetheless, these ontological precepts emphasise difference and becoming rather than identity and essence, so they still leave a great deal to the specifics of different historical contexts. So writing about the past in new materialist terms is not simply about granting things a generalised animacy, but are writing about the specific sets of relations, which we can term assemblages, meshworks, or phenomena, depending on your personal brand of new materialism, and how they emerge in the world. This means the narratives we write have to be specific about all the different elements that make them up. What this means is that new materialist approaches have tended to work at the small scale. They often examine specific objects, looking at the detail in their production and use. They might write about the specific assemblage of a certain burial and how post-human identity emerges through difference. They might discuss the detail of how cremations are handled and worked and how this changes through time. 
If you read the new, li new materialist literature, it tends towards the vignette and the example rather than building up narrative. This is not a resistance to narrative per se, however, but rather, I think, A, a symptom of a new way of doing things, we just haven't got there yet, and B, a recognition that working at historical scales becomes very difficult when so much more is in flux. Thus, the challenge, I believe, for new materialism is how to move up to the kinds of scales we want to talk about. How can we write at a scale that's broadly comparable with those made possible by Bayesian modelling? How can we generalise about our things, each its own relational gathering, to be able to write history in a satisfactory manner? Now, here I think Bayesian chronologies really help us because of the way they open up particularities of engagement with certain sites and materials and can allow us to think about how materials work in specific ways and specific times. One of the reasons new materialists have tended towards a small scale is the fear that any larger scale they would, at any larger scale, they would simply return to generalised narratives about their topics. Working with Bayesian <coughs> chronologies, though, helps to refine the ways in which relations form, the order of events, and with that, the pattern of relations at any particular time. If the properties of stone are no longer fixed, but historically emergent, our ability to look at how stones are being treated at certain points of time through refined chronologies that means we could start to tease out history of stone itself. This material, far from timeless and unchanging, has its own history, which interweaves with humans in different ways. In an excellent paper, recent paper, Mark Gillings and Josh Pollard have asked us to attend to the material qualities of stones at the late Neolithic site of Avebury. They ask us to attend to their vibrancy and their instability. At the same site, Emily Banfield has drawn our attention to the specific assemblages in which stone, clay and chalky rubble emerge, the way in which we may be able to think about different clays, different chalks. Yet imagine if Avebury was as well dated as a Bayesian modelled causeway enclosure from a millennia, millennia earlier. Imagine how much more specific these narratives might be. We might be able to trace how different chalks emerged and faded, how certain stones were linked to certain events and not others. Sequence, order, tempo. These matter, and they matter just as much to materials and their role in history as they do to people. As the philosopher Timothy Morton has recently put it, there is always much more to parts and holes. Both Bayesian analysis and new materialism act to draw eyes downwards to concentrate on the specific. In both cases, they allow new actors to appear who were previously invisible to us. They materialise them in front of us. Bayesian modelling allows us to unpick the order and tempo of events. Events which are themselves the coming together and emergence of new relations. In turn, new materialism asks us to widen our attention to include all the new actors that are playing their part in the events that Bayesian modelling can make visible. The trick then, I would suggest, is not how to align the specificities and particularism of new materialism and Bayesian modelling. They're the perfect match. In contrast, the question is about how to use both to write at different scales, to work from a level below that accessible to Bayesian analysis, for example, the napping of a specific flint tool over a few minutes, up to the generational scales or decadal scales these model co models can help us with, and up again to the larger scale patterns and dynamisms of different periods. Gathering time is a great example of the latter. It builds together nearly a millennia of analysis over two countries, working what, at what I think I could, could be described as a decently large, if not enormous, scale. From the other end, in September, Rachel Crellin and I will be starting a new project, working with our colleague Hugh Barton and a yet-to-be-named postdoc, looking at how to use... <laughs> contact me if you'd like to be the named postdoc. <laughs> uh, working with our colleague... Uh, sorry, um, looking at how the use of materials changes through time. We will be using microware analysis to look at flint, copper and bronze objects from the late Neolithic to the start of the Iron Age. Our project covers a long time scale, but is materially focused and targeted. Embracing a new materialist approach, our aim is to write precise histories of these materials, and wherever, wherever possible we will be targeting objects that are well dated. Bayesian modelling won't always be available to us, but where it is we can use to see if these objects vary in their use in specific ways at specific times. The use of objects, of course, links to their historically emergent properties, and through this to their role in history. When we speak of history, we are talking about multiple lines and trajectories that interweave and intersect. There are different ways of writing and approaching these pasts. To work through this, we need to think about scale itself. We need to think about the past in terms of nested scales, small, medium, and large. The questions one asks leads one to engage primarily at one or the other. But scale actually folds, it bends, isn't neatly Euclidean, it's topological. 
It has an intensity to it. So when we're writing about a specific object or a site, we're always building and bending multiple scales to work through this. A single flint scraper folds multiple scales within it, from the geological to the archaeological to the cultural to the personal. The opposition of scales isn't helpful, they're all always present. So we need to open ourselves up to realising that whilst we might focus our work at a level where a particular scale is most intensively present, others will be too. Within the particular approach to new materialism that I tend to employ, drawing primarily on the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze, the world can be divided into the virtual and the actual, both of which are equally real. The actual represents the measurable parts of the world around us, the length, width, weight of the objects in front of me, its properties, in other words. The virtual is a space of potentials, the capacities that an object or a person has that are real, but not necessarily actual. One of the concepts I'm currently working on is that we can approach the archaeological record as a virtual space, which we actualise through our writings, through the narratives we construct. What both new materialism and Bayesian modelling do is allow us to make certain elements of the virtual potentials of the past actual in different ways. They allow us to specify and map that virtual space, to individuate the past from the generic towards the specific, the particular and the actual. This all involves working at different scales, but also investigating the relationship between different scales in our own work. The session abstract calls for us to break down the barrier between history and prehistory in the sense of disciplinary traditions as much as the boundaries of time itself. If what we mean by history is the specific events and relations that constituted the past, that differentiate one past from another, then I have no issue with that call. However, what is equally pressing, what matters regardless of the scale at which we operate, is that we continue to challenge the idea that our past is solely about humans. That doesn't do our histories any good, and it doesn't do our understanding of humanity any good either. I would argue that one of our primary challenges is to develop an understanding of the past that denies what Donna Haraway would call the foolishness of human exceptionalism, to build an approach that relishes the fact that humans are always caught up with, becoming with, a host of other historical actors. This matters in the present because one of the primary reasons we can't challenge climate change or capitalism or racism is because we remain wedded to an anthropocentric humanism, one that was always drawn a boundary not around humans but around a particular vision of humankind one that is far less than the sum of the humans that make it up. It also matters in the past, because if we want to be specific about the kinds of histories that happened, we need to be specific about the kinds of human being that existed. To do that, we have to put people in their proper historical context, not to hold back an essential humanism from history's grasp. In turn, this means allowing our materials to play a more vital role. I believe that our increasingly sophisticated chronologies have emerged precisely because we have learned to listen to our materials, using a variety of new machines, statistical models, and statistical models in important and interesting ways. Thus, our hope for both an accurate understanding of the past and an ecologically sound future rests upon us giving up the vestiges of anthropocentrism. It is my belief the more accurate dating will help us achieve a less anthropocentric past by offering an ever more nuanced account of the historical relations <coughs> through which people, plants, animals and things emerge together. Thanks very much indeed.